So what 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 is Halloween? You know, it's obviously been exploited these days for by commercial interests, but they didn't invent it. Unlike, you know, Father's Day, Mother's Day, some of some of this stuff, you feel, you know, is this an invention invention of commercial interest? But they didn't invent this, and it has pretty sinister origins, actually. It goes way, way back to the celebration of a druid called Sanheim, who was believed to have control over the spirits of the dead. And uh, October the 31st, which was celebrated at that time as New Year's Eve, became a time of honoring Samhain and making offerings to evil spirits. When Christianity spread to the UK, the church began to celebrate All Saints Day one day later on the 1st of November with a celebration of light and goodness, celebr- um, focused on celebrating the, the lives of faithful Christians who'd gone to be with Jesus. It was a kind of antidote to Halloween. And both pagans and Christians continued to celebrate their very different festivals one on one day, the other on the next. And Halloween grew into a night to mock the church and to perform um, uh, unholy acts and to honor everything that was not of God. You know, that's the origin of the thing. The popular practice died out after the Middle Ages, but during the 20th century, as we know, um, Halloween's been revived. It's, It's a major pagan festival. And it's become a respectable family event observed by many who have no appreciation of its original purpose. Uh, But all the trappings still make clear that what's being celebrated is, is darkness and evil rather than goodness and light. Surely our our heart as Christians at Halloween is not to, um, uh, major on the origins of this thing, not to condemn and criticize what's going on around us, but as always, to shine light into darkness. To bless, to treat and not to treat. So do come and join us this evening as we seek to do this in a a small way this year. Meanwhile, I want to introduce what I have to say this morning this is the start of the talk, by the way. That was just that was just sort of part of the notices, really, you know, sort of building on what Shami said earlier. Okay, so the talk starts now. At 20 to 1, according to my watch, but <laughs> I will turn it back later. I want to refer to an article that appeared a while ago in Private Eye magazine and it was called god to leave the church of england there'd been a, an accident exodus of anglican vicars over the issue of women's ordination around that time let me just read you an extract from the article following the precedent set by leader leading former Am- anglicans god has indicated that he too is to leave the church of england According to sources close to God, he's been unhappy for some time with the direction the Anglican Church has been taking and has now finally had enough of it. A Church of England spokesman said, losing God is is a bit of a blow, but it's just something we're going to have to live with. (laughs) And, um, yeah. I thought that was really funny, and it could have been applied to anything other than that. You know, a a lot of churches, and as so often with extracting humor from a situation, it it can also give pause for thought, because I'm sure many of us have visited churches of various denominations that that have just felt cold and dead, but like they're going through the motions of this, that they, they, they lost God somewhere along the road, and they seem pretty comfortable just living with that situation kind of settled for it. And the New Testament talks too about other churches that give every appearance of life, loads of activity, good reputation, 
two of these referred to in those letters to the churches at the beginning of Re uh, Revelation. But at the core, those churches had lost their closeness to God. Any real sense of his presence. And individual Christians, as I'm sure we're, we're, we're all painfully aware, can sadly become shadows of what they were. God, who was once central to their lives, becomes marginalized at best. How can that be? Especially in the light of what we were looking at last week, which is, was what God really, really wants. You know, that song that we sang just before I came on about, you know, who am I that God should take any notice of me? And when you consider that the whole plan as revealed in the Bible is about us being able to stand his presence, live in the light of his presence. You know, isn't, isn't that mind-blowing? I just want to capture again and again and again the wonder of it. You know, we can get so blasé, our, our view of God just kind of dwindles into, into something far, far less than he is. We can never fully comprehend his greatness. But I'd like to understand more and more of who he is and of his great love. We focused on three Old Testament tents. You'll recall the tabernacle, David's tabernacle, Moses' tent of meeting to see what they had to teach us about what God really, really wants for us. And the conclusion is, is just irrefutable. He wants to restore us so that we can live in his presence, walk in the light of his presence, and do that uh, in the context of a, a father-child relationship with him, one that's growing into a friendship relationship with him. And this, in turn, only occurs to the extent that what we want, what we're really going for in this life, aligns with what God wants. That's the other side of the coin, and it's what I want us to ponder for a short time this morning. What do I really, really want? It's a vital question. Jesus said this in, in Matthew 6, verse 19. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That which we treasure that which we desire and value most highly. That's what captivates our hearts. That's what will dominate our lives. And notice, you can't be robbed of tre treasures in heaven. You can only rob yourselves of them. What you, what, let me just ask the question. Let me just, just make it personal to each of us. What do you most want? most treasure, most value in life at this moment? Or to pose what's essentially the same question, what takes up most of your time and energy? Your family, your career, your business, your hobby, some sport, possessions, pursuit of a better home, a better this, a better that, keeping yourself entertained, Achieving a sense of self-worth, some pet project? Well, none, none of these things are bad in themselves. But if any of them displaces God, knowing him and his presence with you as your number one priority, they rob you of God's best. Where does spending quality time with God, getting up close to him, enjoying his presence, developing relationship with him, where does that appear in our scale of values? 
in the list of what we really, really want. Even if church activities are kind of right up there, really high on the list, we may still be missing out, still failing to enjoy the fullness of life as a child of God, experiencing and enjoying his presence. Why is it important that our priorities align with God's? that we value knowing his presence as much as he values just just sharing his presence with us, being with us, spending time with us. I just want to suggest three reasons. There are loads of them, I'm sure. But these were the ones that, that, that I just felt God brought to me as I was, I was just thinking around this whole thing. Only God's presence distinguishes Christians from others. There are lots of really lovely people around. One of the things I've discovered since we've been in this building, we've been trying to work into this area, is that there are some great people working for uh, secular um, charitable organizations working in this community who put a lot of us Christians to shame in terms of their, their care for people, you know, for what they do in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, okay, as Christians, I trust we are caring, we're loving, but what, what's the real difference? The difference is that Christians carry the presence of God, and that brings another, another dimension into it. So if, if we're not consciously doing that, we actually don't have any more to contribute than anybody else. Moses, in Exodus 33, 15, said to God, if your presence does not go with us, Lord, don't send us up from here. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? It's not moving in, in miracle power that sets Christians apart from the rest of humanity. You know, it's good, it's good to get into that. And I, I, I want to get into it more and more. Um, but that's, that's not what makes a Christian. In fact, Jesus said in solemn words in Matthew 7, 22, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. Or as the message puts it, all you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. As far as God's concerned, it's not about what we, we do in his name. However powerful that is, even if it blesses other people, it's an issue of relationship, an issue of knowing him. I've, I'm sure you've heard me come up with this quote before. Oh, sorry, I've done that bit. From a guy called Harry Greenwood, who was a kind of leader in the charismatic movement when I first came in touch with, you know, what, what the Holy Spirit is doing today. And he said, the anointing of God on a man's ministry, on the work that he does for God, is God's signature to the truth he is preaching. The presence of God in a man's life is God's approval of his life. Jesus chose his first disciples so that they might be with him and that he might send them out. Mark 7. It's vital that we don't neglect the first part, that just being with him, that we don't get caught up in loads of activity at the expense of spending time with him, because that's the source of everything. Look, we know this. I know this is not rocket science, but I've just felt God's been stirring me about that afresh. You know, let's just, just decide what the main thing is and go for it. The main thing for God, as we were seeing last time, is that we enjoy his presence and, and live in it. And, um, oh, 
surely our worlds need to align with that. Second reason why it's important that our priorities align is that, that God's promises find their fulfillment in his presence. You know, God this doesn't dispense goodies from afar. It's as we're really knowing his presence that we receive things. You know, joy. Psalmist said in Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Again in Psalm 21, verse 6, it says, surely, the, 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 the writer of, of that psalm says, surely you've granted me unending blessings and made me glad with the joy of your presence. Rest. The Lord uh, said to Moses in reply to the request we we mentioned earlier in Exodus 33, my presence will go with you and I will give you wet rest. Freedom. 2 Corinthians 3, 7, now the Lord is the Spirit. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, he gives freedom. Peace. The old hymn says, dear, dear Lord and Father of mankind, drop. You're still dues of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of your peace. It says we, we're just living with him. Refreshing. Anybody in need of a bit of that this morning? Come on, you had an extra hour in bed. You know, you probably needed it more yesterday. Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Power. God brought you out of Egypt with his own presence, um, Moses said to the people, by his great power. Now, God's presence and his power hand in hand. You know, we were talking about, it. you know, there was that, image that, that Richard brought for us of a motorbike and of the power of God in our lives. And, and, and we can enjoy that power in our lives, but it's not some abstract thing divorced from God's presence. Healing. It says of Jesus in Luke 5 that the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. It was as God was present there that the power was released. And, and it, it was just, just there in Jesus. It talks in Luke 6 about people trying to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. Security. I've got left behind, guys. Whoa. Whoa. Psalm 31.20, we'll stop there. We, we could go on, but Psalm 31.20 says, you hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongue. So all of that and so much more is found in his presence and only in his presence. Another thing that... Uh, uh, is a reason why it's important that our priorities align with God. I know you, 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 you probably have heard me quote from this book before. I dared to call him Father, by Bill Quis Sheikh, who's a, a fifty-nine, a fifty-two-year-old Muslim w woman who converted to Christianity in Pakistan during the nineteen sixties. Um, and when she. Descri she describes her experience of becoming a Christian like this. She said, I got out of bed, I sank to my knees on the rug, looked up to heaven, and in rich new understanding called God my Father. I was not prepared for what happened because she'd been a Muslim. She'd never felt able to address God as Father.
She said, oh, my father, my father, father God. Suddenly the room wasn't empty anymore. He was there. I could sense his presence. I could feel his hand lay gently on my head. For a long time I knelt there, sobbing quietly, floating in his love. I found myself talking with him, apologizing for not having known him before. And again came his loving compassion like a warm blanket settling around me. That's all it took. And she continued to enjoy a powerful sense of God's presence with her until one evening she made a decision not to go to a particular meeting. And in her words, it seemed like a little thing, but almost instantly I began to feel uneasy. What was it? I walked through the house restlessly. Everything was in order, yet everything seemed out of order. She prayed, and it slow, slowly dawned on her what she'd lost. I'd lost the sense of God's presence. It was gone. Why? Did it have something to do with me not, not going to that meeting? She concluded that it did, went to the meeting, and she writes, what a difference. Immediately, I felt, I actually felt the return of warmth to my soul. Nothing unusual took place at the meeting, yet I knew I was again walking in his glory. And that was how I learned to move back into his presence quickly. Whenever I did not fear his nearness, feel his nearness, I knew that I had grieved him. I would search backwards until I spotted the time when I last knew his presence. Then I would review every act, every word or thought until I discovered where I'd gone astray. At that point, I would confess my sin, ask for his forgiveness and repent, turn away. I discovered, oh, oh, repentance, I discovered, was not tearful remorse so much as admitting where I'd gone wrong and avowing with his power, his help, never to make the mistake of doing that in the future. You know, I fear that many of us, maybe, maybe all of us, would have to backtrack quite a long way to get to the point where we last had a powerful sense of God's presence with us so that when it left us, we'd know instantly. But don't you think it would be good for us to keep shorter accounts with God? Don't you think that when David uses that phrase, walking in the light of his presence in Psalm 89, he may be referring to a lifestyle more like Bilquis Shakes than that of most Christians today. In the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel 4, 21, the daughter-in-law of Eli the priest named her son Ichabod. Don't know too many, too many kids called Ichabod, do you? Probably because it means no glory. She named him Ichabod, saying the glory of the presence of God has departed from Israel because of the capture of the Ark of the Lord. Bit rough on this little kid, wasn't it? You know, the presence of God loses Israel and he gets lumbered with the name. But I reckon maybe we, we've met some Ichabods, people who once gave every indication of enjoying God's presence in their lives but now show little or no signs of spiritual life. Oh God, may it not describe any of us, ever. Churches that once pulsated with God's presence are now all but devoid of spiritual vitality. Let that never be true of this church. You know, whatever phase we're going through, whatever the numerical situation, whatever the age mix, let that never be true. It's tragic, isn't it, when any individual or any church misses out what God really, really wants for them and went to such lengths to make, po make possible the enjoyment of his friendship and presence. I just want quickly now just to look at a few examples of things that rob us of the enjoyment of his presence. The first one is obviously sin. 
behaving in ways that we know are displeasing to God. Samson became so blasé about his sexual philandering that we're told in Judges 16.20, he didn't realize that the Lord had left him. David, a man who knew what it was to live in God's presence after his adultery with Bathsheba, just felt, um, felt the Holy Spirit withdrawing from him and cried out in anguish in Psalm 51 verse 11, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Sin's got a really broad definition in the Bible. Hasn't it? You know, James 4.17 says, anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Romans 14.23, everything that does not come from faith is sin. It includes everything that grieves the Holy Spirit, that quenches him, puts out his fire. So sin is obviously something that is going to rob us of the enjoyment of God's presence. Failure to understand what being a Christian is all about may mean that we, we, we never get to enjoy his presence. Sadly, there are some people who, who are Christians, but they don't actually get into that place where they're enjoying God's presence. What is being a Christian all about? You know, first and foremost, it's about living to please God rather than ourselves. That's what repentance is, making that 180-degree turn. So we're living for him now. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.15 says. Jesus died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. That's surely the essence of what it means to become a Christian. Ephesians 5 verse 10 exhorts us to find out what pleases him. if We want to really go on in our Christian, Christian faith. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2 4, we're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. And he says of himself in 2 Corinthians 5 9, we make it our goal to please him. So it's about living to please God rather than ple pleasing ourselves. And it's about relationship, not rules. Matthew. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. What God does in the Bible is not so much lay down rules as to exhort us to enter into and develop a relationship with him and wholesome relationships with others. And he sets the parameters within which that can happen. And he provides a way for that to happen. You know, we can only truly love someone we know well. And with God, to know him is to love him. It's natural to want to please someone we love. The two things flow one from another. God's presence is guaranteed if we're living to please him. Final thing I want to say, you know, that, that robs us of God's presence is busyness. Luke 10 records what appears to be Jesus' first visit to a family home in Bethany. The incident will be familiar to most of us. We're told in verse 38, a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus and his disciples into her home. She had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it, and it won't be taken away from her. Now, Mary and Martha both loved Jesus. They were both waiting on him here. But Martha hadn't realized 
that in her desire to serve, she was actually neglecting Jesus. And this is a danger we can so easily fall into. We can be so busy even doing things for Jesus that we don't spend any quality time with Jesus. Our service itself becomes a distraction from the main thing, degenerates into much activity that robs us from the, of the enjoyment of his presence. Jesus didn't blame Martha for being concerned about household chores. He was merely challenging her to consider her priorities. Jesus was only there on a very brief visit. What was the most important thing right then? Is the right time just to be with Jesus, a right time to work for him? Let's not neglect the former. So just ever so quickly in conclusion, how do we grow in the enjoyment of God's presence? As we all know, it's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. It uh, goes hand in hand with growing in our relationship with him. There are no shortcuts. It can only happen through really getting into God's word and going on being filled with his Holy Spirit. There are inevitably ups and downs, but with God, there's always more. However much you, you may have um, experienced of his presence in your life, there's always more. That's certainly been my experience. In fact, uh, in my experience, I've encountered God's presence most powerfully at a number of crisis moments in my life. all coming at times when, for one reason or another, I've been desperately crying out to him. Three immediately come to mind, and uh, they, they happen in all, all sorts of locations. First one is the evening I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in, in that nondescript building in Arcade Street in Ipswich, which at the time was a scout hall. I first experienced a baptism in the Holy Spirit. It was transformational. The second one is when I, I first went full-time as a church leader in 1994. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it occurred in this, uh, this, this building at the end of the runway at um, Toronto Airport. Couldn't even get a photograph without a plane flying over the top of it. And the third time was when I'd had some very challenging situations to face in the church, and I was feeling exhausted, the end of my tether. And um, I, I just went off to this lonely, um, to this, this way well, isn't lonely, this Welsh conference center in a, in a very remote location, Fulda Brennan, and to a chapel just up the road that had associations with. Um, with the Welsh revival, God just came again. How hungry and thirsty are we for him? It falls down to that, and that, you know, we can sort of settle for, um, you know, I, or I always feel, feel better after getting into God's word or going to a meeting or listening to a praise and worship tape, and that's good. And there's a measure of God's presence in all of those things, but really really just experiencing his power right up close. So wh wh where are you right now? It's possible that someone listening to me, Zoom or somehow, is not yet a Christian or unsure about whether, whether you really are or not but you're struggling with some problem. Jesus invites us to come. He starts almost invariably by dealing with a presenting problem. And that's good. And we can choose just to go away, grateful for having the problem solved, or we can decide we want to go on and build a relationship with him. Maybe some of us just know that we're not where we once were. We've drifted away. Any sense of God's presence seems distant. 
Maybe you're desperate to encounter, encounter him afresh. Maybe you're just wanting more of his presence. Come on. We can encounter him for the first time or for the umpteenth time this morning. Let's draw near right now. Let's make our concluding song our prayer. The words of the song are basically putting onto our lips the heart cry of Paul in Philippians chapter 3. And the repeated refrain of the song is, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. And the song just expresses a desire to know him more. May that be the case for each one of us today.